Our first foray into the diversity of life on Earth will take us into the invisible realm of prokaryotes. Why is it in quotes? I will certainly talk about that. First item on the agenda is to reveal the learning objectives for this lecture. Here are the first seven learning objectives for this lecture, and here are six more. So what I'm going to lecture on here is how you can do these things outlined in these objectives. Before we get into the prokaryotes, I think an important point needs to be addressed. That is, are viruses alive? A very simple answer would be to say, not really. So we won't talk about them in a great amount of detail. But let's, just because they are, let's say, life adjacent, I will say a couple of things about them. Viruses are comprised of small bits of nucleic acids, DNA or RNA, which can be single-stranded or double-stranded. Sometimes they also have a protein coat, as we've seen in bacteriophages, such as Hershey and Chase used in their famous experiments. Or they may have a lipid coat encapsulating the nucleic acid, but that's it. No organelles, no cytoplasm, no ribosomes. But since they are made of these biological molecules, nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, they require living organisms to produce them. But in a sense, they are like hair or fingernails or eggshells. They are incapable of independent reproduction. This is important because of the few viruses that cause diseases. There are many, many viruses that don't cause any disease, but for that important minority that do, it is necessary not to treat the diseases they cause as though viruses were alive. Antibiotics, for example, are used to treat living pathogens like bacteria, protists, and parasitic animals. Antibiotics are only effective on cellular forms of life. Kind of like how in the old movie Predator, Arnold Schwarzenegger gave us this pearl of wisdom. We have to use other methods to fight viral diseases. For example, vaccines. So what do viruses lack? Let's look at this table, which should show some familiar information from principles of biology once again. As you can see, cellular life, subject of this course, possesses all characteristics of life. Viruses only possess some of them, not all of them. Viruses are fascinating and important to study, and many of you will probably take a course in virology at some point in the future. But we will be turning our attention back to cellular life now. What is a prokaryote? I doubt it is the first time you are hearing this, but a prokaryote is a cellular organism that lacks a nucleus. But more broadly, it lacks any membrane-bound organelles that are only found in eukaryotes, which include endoplasmic reticulum, vacuoles, lysosomes. Also, they have no cytoskeleton, which means no microtubules, intermediate filaments, or microfilaments, or any of those functions that those structures provide, which I encourage you to review at your leisure. And then, no mitochondria or chloroplast, which, while they are bounded by membranes, are not part of the endomembrane system. Does this mean prokaryotes can't respire or photosynthesize? No, it does not mean that. Prokaryotic cells invented these processes, and we eukaryotes are just the remixed versions of them. More on that in this chapter also. So, quick review from previous lecture. Synapomorphies are shared derived characteristics, symplesiomorphies are shared ancestral characteristics, and autapomorphies are unshared derived characteristics. Which of them is best for defining clades? I can't hear you, of course, but I will assume you said synapomorphies. Good job! Synapomorphies is the correct answer. Prokaryotes are defined by not having a nucleus. And lacking a nucleus is a 
symplesiomorphy, or shared ancestral characteristic. The most ancient forms of life were cells that had no nuclei. Thus, we can describe a group of organisms that have no nuclei as prokaryotes, but we should recognize that they don't constitute a clade. It was not all that long ago that prokaryotic cells were thought to be a monolithic group called the monera, meaning single-celled, and that all monera were bacteria. But as experimental techniques advanced, scientists were able to make more sensitive tests and our ability to resolve the differences between types of prokaryotic cells improved. Toward the end of the 20th century, a pioneer in the field of comparing DNA sequences across microbial species, Carl Woese, suggested that the differences between nucleus lacking cellular life forms were much deeper than were previously thought. Deeper than the differences between familiar macroscopic forms of life such as plants, fungi, and animals. Woese said that we need a new taxonomic grouping above the kingdom level, which I've already told you is called the domain. His lab was able to determine the DNA sequence for genes that are truly universal, the genes for the RNA components of ribosomes. Comparing the sequences from different prokaryotes revealed a vast gulf between them. Thus, Woese proposed splitting the prokaryotic lineages into two domains, bacteria and archaebacteria, which we now call archaea. The name archaea means ancient ones, since most of the members of archaea seem to inhabit extreme habitats that were reminiscent of an ancient earth, extremes such as high heat, high salt concentration, and low pH, or high acidity. Adding in the ribosomal DNA of the eukaryotes revealed an interesting relationship between the three domains, as we can see in this phylogram. While Woese thought of archaea as having characters that he predicted the most ancient forms of life would possess, the archaeans evidently share a clade with the eukaryotes. Does this mean that the archaeans are not ancient? No, it doesn't. Nor does it mean that the lineage we eukaryotes share with archaea is more recently derived from the bacteria. Prokaryotes show a number of characteristics, but all these characteristics are symplesiomorphies, which again are shared ancestral conditions. They lack nuclei and other membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotes share a number of characteristics, but all these characteristics are symplesiomorphies, which again are shared ancestral conditions. They lack nuclei and other membrane-bound organelles. Without membrane-bound organelles like ER and Golgi apparatus, surface-to-volume ratios limit their size in most cases. Individual archaeal and bacterial cells are very small compared to eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells average between 10 and 100 microns, Bacterial and archaeal cells are typically on the order of 1 to 5 microns. There are no truly multicellular prokaryotic organisms, though there are a few that form colonies big enough to see with the naked eye. In terms of the cellular morphology or shape, the options are fairly limited compared to the great diversity of shell, cell shape, form, and function we see even in a single multicellular eukaryote. Very generally, there are three shapes for cells that we need to learn about in our very brief coverage of these two domains. Spheres, called cocci, or coccus is the singular. Rod shapes are called bacilli, and spiral shapes are called spirilla. Under a powerful compound light microscope, cocci resemble circles. But cells are three-dimensional, so their shape is more accurately a sphere or ball shape. On a color-enhanced scanning electron micrograph, as we see here, they resemble clusters of grapes, which I'll say something more about in a few moments. Bacilli, or rods, look more like hot dogs or sausages, 
or Cheetos, depending on what you may be hungry for at the moment. That's what we're looking at here. Spirilla resemble corkscrews, or maybe pasta, or maybe a single helix. While cells may be solitary, they can also be found in distinctive colonial forms. A couple of terms that describe these forms include the Greek word prefixes staphylo, which means cluster of grapes, and strepto, which means twisted chain or string. Mm -hmm. You very well may know of some bacteria that show these forms. These prefixes can be added to the names of the shapes of these cells to give us names such as Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. Species of Staphylococcus are the pathogens responsible for staph infections. Streptococcus is responsible for strep throat. As for the anatomical features of cells, let us begin with the genomes of prokaryotes. The most famous facet of prokaryotic life is having no nucleus. Every essential gene is contained on a singular circular chromosome. This chromosome occupies a large volume of the space in the cytosol. This area is called the nucleoid because our eukaryotic brains see a mass of DNA and think, that looks like a nucleus, sort of. I'll name it something that means like a nucleus. But it's not a nucleus. It's able to interact with the ribosomes very intimately, allowing for simultaneous transcription and translation. In addition to the large main chromosome, these organisms may have smaller loops of DNA called plasmids. These plasmids contain genes that are not strictly essential or housekeeping genes, but may encode proteins that are advantageous. One example is a plasmid may encode proteins that enable a cell to resist antibiotic drugs. One way to think about it is, imagine the nucleoid contains the operating system for the cell. Everything necessary to make the cell run at a basic level. Plasmids are like apps that can be copied and downloaded or transferred to other cells. Antibiotic resistance, for example. If a colony is exposed to an antibiotic, only cells with resistance can survive. So that plasmid becomes a hot commodity. The plasmid can be copied to and transferred to other cells in a process known as horizontal gene transfer. Compare this with vertical gene transfer, which is how we eukaryotes acquire our genes from our parents. Continuing with the theme of reproduction, it should be noted that while cell division is reproduction in prokaryotes being unicellular, that mode of division is called binary fission. Binary fission is very different from mitosis or meiosis. Remember, prokaryotes don't have linear chromosomes or microtubules or nuclear envelopes, so mitosis and meiosis are not options, which also means prokaryotes are completely asexual. So how do we get genetic diversity in prokaryotes? Mutation is still the source of new genes, but prokaryotes have another proverbial trick up their sleeves. As I just mentioned, this is called horizontal gene transfer, or cells sharing DNA with other cells without parenting them. Horizontal gene transfer occurs in three main ways, transformation, conjugation, and transduction. Transformation is when cells pick up plasmids from their environment. This is how Frederick Griffith's R bacteria transformed into S bacteria in his experiments with mice. Conjugation is the transfer of plasmids between living cells using a structure called a pilus. Transduction is when a virus can move gene be between cells. Let's continue our tour of tiny anatomy with cell walls. The majority of prokaryotic cells have some type of cell wall. The composition of these cell walls are different from eukaryotic cell walls, and the two domains have different materials in their cell walls. Bacteria have cell walls made of a substance called peptidoglycan, which is a polymer of proteins and carbohydrates. Archaea have cell walls that are made of a similar substance, though not identical, and it's called pseudopeptidoglycan.
Focusing on the bacteria, there is a common diagnostic test performed to determine the structure of the outermost layer of these cells. This is the gram stain assay. Cells that are gram positive have an outermost layer of peptidoglycan that binds to the crystal violet stain, making the cells appear purple. If there isn't an outermost layer of peptidoglycan, because it's covered by an outer membrane, or because there is no cell wall at all, or because the cell wall is not made out of peptidoglycan, like in archaea or eukaryotes, the cells appear pink and are called gram-negative. Some cells may have a gluey layer external to the cell wall called a capsule. This capsule allows cells to adhere to the cells of a host, like many pathogenic bacteria do, including the pneumococcal bacteria from Griffith's famous experiments. Some bacteria use shafts of protein called fimbriae for the same purpose, to adhere to host cells or other substrates. This is more like Velcro than glue. Another external feature I've mentioned previously is a pilus, or perhaps several pili. A pilus is a hollow cylinder, like a straw, that cells can use to transfer plasmids by conjugation. Since this is an interaction between living cells and genetic information is transferred, this is sometimes called bacterial sex, though it's not. Again, prokaryotes are asexual. I've said that a couple of times, so it must be important. Bacteria and archaea don't always need to stay put. Sometimes they need to move and move in a particular direction. The cells we are talking about may produce flagella or perhaps a single flagellum. It's called a flagellum and we've seen flagella in eukaryotes, but the structure of prokaryotic flagella is very different. Just like you might see a pickup truck rolling down the road and you know it has an engine in it, but does that engine run on gasoline or diesel fuel? There are a lot of different moving parts between the two. Eukaryotic flagella are powered by microtubules, which are part of the cytoskeleton, which, I'll say it again, cytoskeletons are a thing prokaryotes do not have. So how does a prokaryotic flagellum work? A prokaryotic flagellum works by means of motor proteins, but not tubulins. The shaft of the prokaryotic flagellum is a filament made of a protein called flagellin, kind of like a weed whacker filament. You might look at this diagram and think it looks sort of like ATP synthase, and that's not too far off. In fact, the power to spin the flagellum comes from a proton motor force just like in ATP synthase. The main takeaway from this diagram, though, is that it is very much not a eukaryotic flagellum. They are analogous structures. So now that you know a little about how these cells move, where are they going? Movement in the direction of a stimulus is called taxis. Not taxis, like the cars that drive you home after a night out, but taxis. Positive taxis is movement towards a stimulus, and negative taxis is movement away from a stimulus. Two very common types of taxis are phototaxis and chemotaxis. Photo means light, and a photosynthetic organism, like a cyanobacterium, would experience positive phototaxis to maximize its ability to photosynthesize. Chemotaxis is movement associated with some chemical signal in the environment. A bacterium that was sensitive to an antibiotic being produced by another organism would need to get away from that chemical to survive, and that would be an example of negative chemotaxis. Another response to adverse environmental conditions is to form structures called endospores. Endospores are metabolically inactive. An endospore is kind of like a suit of armor hibernating. The cell is protected until conditions allow for it to emerge under more favorable conditions. Some endospore forms are distinctive, such as these from the bacterium that causes tetanus, Clostridium tetani. They are known for resembling tennis rackets. Even though their morphological diversity is limited in size and shape relative to we eukaryotes, the number of different ways prokaryotes produce energy and biomass, 
That is to say, their metabolic diversity is far, far, far greater than what we see in our domain. In Biology 1020, we learn about aerobic cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Both of these processes originated in the prokaryotic domains, but were only a small part of the number of metabolic pathways that are possible and still exist on our planet. You may recall that heterotrophic organisms require other organisms to provide energy and sources of carbon to produce biomass. We humans and all other animals are heterotrophic. Autotrophs are self-feeding, meaning that they can produce energy and or biomass without the influence of other organisms. Plants are the most familiar autotrophs. But in the prokaryotes, there are both photoautotrophs and photoheterotrophs. Photoautotrophs, like plants, can use sunlight for both parts of photosynthesis. The light reactions to produce energy in the form of ATP, and the Calvin cycle which uses that ATP to fix carbon dioxide back into carbohydrates as building blocks and for energy storage. But some prokaryotic organisms can only perform the light reactions. They can make the ATP, but they require outside sources of carbon compounds. No Calvin cycle. These organisms are photoheterotrophs. In some organisms, they are capable of using naturally occurring chemicals such as sulfur, iron, hydrogen gas, or ammonia instead of sunlight as a, an energy source for ATP production and for driving the Calvin cycle. These are chemoautotrophs, and they are typically found in some of the Earth's most extreme environments, such as thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. Mixotrophs can use different combinations of energy sources for respiration and biosynthesis. While on the topic of oxygen, we find that some bacteria are capable of aerobic respiration without the benefit of mitochondria. Others can grow without oxygen or anaerobically. There are bacteria and archaea that can grow either in the presence or absence of oxygen, which we call facultative anaerobes while others may not be able to grow at all if oxygen gas is abundant. These are strict or obligate anaerobes. There are still many habitats on Earth that do not have abundant oxygen gas for breathing. Soil, underwater, inside other organisms, the list goes on. In these places, prokaryotes thrive. With aerobic respiration, similar to that performed by our eukaryotic mitochondria, the function of oxygen gas is to accept electrons and form water. Some aerobic prokaryotes can do this, but then there are also anaerobic prokaryotes that can use other molecules to accept depleted electrons. So these organisms can breathe sulfur, nitrate, manganese, iron, or a range of other chemical species instead of oxygen. Yes, there are bacteria that literally breathe metal. So take that, hairband guy. Organisms that literally breathe heavy metal. One reason that archaea took so long to be recognized as being so different is because no archaea are known to cause any disease. The most familiar bacteria that you may have learned about before this semester are agents of disease. A word that means causing disease is pathogenic. Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Pneumococcus from Griffith's experiments, all of these are pathogenic. But these pathogens represent a tiny minority of the diversity of these microscopic creatures. Many, many species of prokaryotes are free living, which doesn't mean that they have tickets to Bonnaroo. It means they don't have a permanent association with a host organism. Just because an organism has a host doesn't mean it is an agent of disease. We are dependent upon many species of bacteria and archaea as mutualists. In mutualistic ecological relationships, two organisms have an intimate and close association in which both organisms gain a benefit. For example, our cells cannot produce vitamin K, which is essential for blood clotting. 
Newborn babies typically receive a vitamin K shot because they are born without any vitamin K producing bacteria in their guts. Shortly after birth, the microbes start growing in our intestines and they stay with us throughout our lives. They have a suitable place to live and we get the essential vitamin. In addition, these microbes are important decomposers, breaking down dead biomass so the nutrients can be recycled. The value of this environmental service is hard to overstate. It is a big deal. Biofilms are microscopic communities where several different species may be found growing together. Remember how I just recently talked about the diversity of energy sources that can be used? In biofilms, this diversity enables several species to operate as a superorganism, sharing resources for mutual benefit. The waste products of one species may be the vital starting material for another. Species may behave very differently depending on whether they are part of the consortium of a biofilm or in monoculture removed from the other species. Eukaryotes typically possess mitochondria and they may possess chloroplasts, but neither of these organelles are found in prokaryotes. However, the processes that mitochondria and chloroplasts perform originated in the prokaryotic lineages. Endosymbiotic theory explains these observations. These organelles are now understood to have once been free-living bacteria that were engulfed by the earliest ancestral eukaryotes, and since that time they have retained their metabolic roles, becoming even more efficient as they developed Christi and thylakoids, but losing their autonomy as complete cells. Modern mitochondria and chloroplast still have their own DNA and functional ribosomes, though many of the genes necessary for their function have been translocated to the nucleus. These chromosomes are circular, like bacterial chromosomes. Chloroplasts also retain an additional membrane layer surrounding the membrane that bounds the stroma. One more line of evidence for endosymbiosis is that microbiologists have identified the lineages that provided the cells that became these organelles. Mitochondria from a group known as the alpha proteobacteria and chloroplasts from the cyanobacteria.